Okay, rock and roll. We're going. We're going. Okay, so I'm Annie Warmke, and uh, this is Carrie Starr. And uh, the reason I wanted to interview Carrie is because um, she's one of the smartest women I've ever met. Oh. And uh, <laughs> and she didn't know it when I met her. Um, and I just feel like anything that I do in my life, I want to try to encourage her intelligence and her brilliance because um, she's she's got a lot of things she's going to do in this world. So well, thank you. that's why we're going to interview today. <laughs> so, anyway, um, so start out by spelling your name and where do you live currently and the name of your business? Okay, so Carrie Star, C A R I E one R Star S T A R R uh, Cherokee Valley Bison Ranch in Thornville, Ohio. All right, I passed. Yeah, you can spell. That's a that's a helpful tool in life. Yeah. So, uh, so what did you want to be when you were a little girl, and how has that translated into where you are today? So, when I was a little girl, I wanted to be a teacher. And I wanted to be an artist. And so I, I just, I knew there wasn't a job that included chopping weeds with a stick and, you know, chasing around in the woods. Cause that was one of the things I liked to do when I was a little girl. But <laughs> what, what motivated you to want, think about being a teacher and an artist? Um, no, I'm not sure what made me want to be a teacher other than maybe watching Little House on the Prairie or something like that. But we played school all the time whenever we would like a bunch of us would get together and I would be the teacher. And uh, maybe I was just like to torture children. I don't know. <laughs> that might be more of it than you think. <laughs> anyway, and I like to create things. I like to draw pictures. And so um, anyway, so how that's translated to today is um, I get to be a teacher. I've taught workshops at our farm and you and I have worked together and uh, we're planning to teach some workshops this year, and um, and as far as the art part of it goes, I get to uh, be creative when I'm like making posts for our farm or designing our literature for advertising and things like that. So, and then of course I do get to go muck around in the woods and be immersed in nature every day. So I think that that uh, those things have all kind of come to fruition. So what, what's your dream job? Well, I am living the dream. Um, well, what is your job then if that's the dream job? <laughs> well, I get to um, be home every day, which I like. Um, I get to uh, hang out with cute little chickens every day and I get to go see the national mammal every day. I get to uh, experience all of the wonderful things that they do. Um, I get to meet lots of cool people. I mean, we've met so many people from all over the world just by having our bison. You know, they've they've sort of introduced me to some some cool people. They helped me uh, get out of my shyness and uh, have something important to talk about. So, um, you know, interacting with people is one of the favorite parts of my job. Most of the days, anyway. <laughs> so, walk me through the day. You get up in the morning. You look at Pinterest. Yes. Well, you know, I'm looking for farm ideas. So. Farm ideas. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, yes. And I do my networking in the morning. Um, What's know, that mean, networking? Well, I'll get on social media and make a post for the day uh, about the farm. Um, I drink lots of coffee, as you know. Um, <laughs> just kind of wake up and then I go down and tend to my little chickens and I check the bison and make sure everybody's present and accounted for. Um, especially if we've had a wind storm or something like that, I'll scan the, the fence line and make sure there's nothing on the fence. And if they're in a faraway pasture, then a lot of times that means going for a pasture walk, which gets me out into nature, which is wonderful. Um, and then uh, I have lots of other projects that I'm working on. Uh, so I'll, I'll work on that. And then uh, at the end of the day, I put on my domestic goddess hat and, you know, whip up dinner and make sure all the laundry is done and that kind of fun stuff. And then, uh, yeah, chill out for the evening. 
So I know you said do lots of other stuff, but some of the things I know you're doing now is mentoring yes, and doing some consulting and things like that. So tell me a little bit about that as far as part of a dream job. Well, I'm getting to interact with other women and teach them and share them and share with them and help to boost their confidence um, with what they're doing. Um, I think that's important. Okay, so what, but how does that work? Like you just like call up women and say, hey, how about if I help you out? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. No. <laughs> that is not you. <laughs> no. So uh, I don't know, I'm a good listener. So people just kind of are drawn to me and will start telling me their problems and things like that. So, uh, but we're also working with W Fan, who has um, sort of organized a, mentoring unofficial mentoring program but you and I did find those women so um yeah so uh, I have a woman that I'm working with and we've kind of picked Tuesdays as our day to get together because she is off on those days so um so what, what do you help her with well I'm helping her with some accounting um business management like figuring out uh you know what she's supposed to be keeping records of because so far, she hasn't uh, hasn't kept many records, and so Yikes. you know, having thirteen years of business record keeping under my belt, uh, I'm able to kind of help her out with those and uh, share my uh, tax accountant information with her. Um, I have a couple of spreadsheets that I've made that uh, are good for tracking uh, those kind of things, so I'm sharing those with her. Um, my experiences with going to farmers markets. Uh, marketing that's something else she's interested in so I'm pretty good at that and yeah, so those are the things so far that we're we're working on and then you have another person you're working with are you doing something different with in your mentoring with her well um we haven't really got started yet because she's a she's a teacher at a college and so uh I think we're going to wait to get started until after her school year is over with just so that she doesn't have another thing on her plate. But uh, I think she's interested in similar things like um, bookkeeping and business, the business end of things. Um, you know, like you and I were discussing the other day, so many people get into farming and they don't worry about the business part of it. They're worried about perfecting their craft, but mm -hmm. you have to have both. Otherwise you're gonna fail miserably. Yeah. And you might even fail miserably, even if you have both. Right, but at least you've got a leg up. <laughs> that's right. You know how you fail. Right, you're knowing that's how right. you fail. That's yes. right. Yes. So that's cool. So, so you think being able to like help other women or share your experiences with other women is part of a dream job? Then definitely, definitely. Um, you know, I'm I'm kind of a shy person, so <laughs> it really. Um, it helps to draw me out. I do things intentionally to get me out of my comfort zone so that I'm constantly building myself up. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, it. that's that. That's a good strategy. <laughs> Just say yes. <laughs> yes, that's right, yes. So, so what inspired you to seek a career in agriculture? I know you're talking about that a little bit, but. Well, so I really had never had any great aspirations to be a farmer. Um, did you I, have some aversion to that? You thought there's something wrong with it? No, that? no, I just didn't, uh, it just never occurred to me that that was a job that I would want to do. Um, so, uh, I was uh, a lab technician for a long time and then I was a safety coordinator and, but I always had this like burning desire to be my own boss. I just never knew what it was. You know, what, what did I want to do? You know, when I was a little girl, I used to, uh, my grandmother had peacocks and so they shed their feathers in the summertime. And so I would always collect all the feathers and then I would uh, get on the bus and I would, I had this real fancy form that I made on notebook paper and I would collect orders for these uh, peacock feathers and then sell them for a quarter a piece. You know, I was making big money when I was in yeah. elementary school. And then they finally made me stop doing it because I don't know <laughs> why. I mean, you'd think they'd want to encourage that. That's but, right. So yeah, I had to quit taking orders for peacock feathers on the bus. But, uh, and then my mom would buy these big bags of bubble yum, uh, bubble gum. And I would take a pocket full of bubble gum to school and sell it to the other kids at school. 
You're an well, entrepreneur. I was, I was, you know, you didn't, I didn't think about that when I was a kid, like, oh, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, but you know, looking uh -huh. back, it's like, wow, I always kind of had a knack for selling things. So I never thought I would be a salesperson yet. Here I am. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I never thought that uh, being a farmer would be a job that I would be able to have. And so um, my goal was to have chickens and goats. Like as a farmer, as more of a hobby. Oh, like, so you were dreaming about this. There was nothing going in that direction yet. Right, right. So no land. You like when I had land, land uh, I thought oh, I'm going to have, I'm going to build a barn. I'm going to have goats and chickens. So uh, when I moved back to uh, our land where I live now, that was my, my dream. But I um, went to dinner at Ted's Montana Grill and I had bison prime rib. And that was the like best thing I'd ever eaten. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I would like to be able to eat that all the time. And then like you have the light bulb moment, you know, the light bulb went off. And uh, I was like, well, I live in the middle of 25 acres. I could raise bison. And so I never thought that it would happen because everything about bison is expensive. And big and big. And I thought, well, you know, if it's, it's a fun little fantasy. I'll be happy to have goats and chickens. And then um, I met Jared and the whole thing kind of came together and, you know. Oh, those men. I know. They cause trouble in your life I know. all the time. <laughs> so anyway, he, he helped me make that dream come true. And uh, so we started with bison first, you know, we got to start small <laughs> with all the easy stuff. Right, right. And then I got <laughs> goats and chickens later, but <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So, well, so how did you find the land that you're on? Well, I am one of those extremely lucky people who had land in the family. And technically I don't own any land, um, but my grandmother uh, had the ultimate plan for her children to never leave her. So when she bought the farm, uh, she had planned exactly how many acres she needed to buy to be able to divide that up among her kids equally so that they would never leave. And so, um, and she didn't want to wait until after she was gone to give the kids the land because she wanted to see them enjoying it. And so she always said, I don't care what you do with it. I just want you to have it. And so um, luckily I have uh, my mom's 25 acres at my disposal. And then I also lease 25 acres from my aunt. So that's how I got my farm. Um, it's, it's good and it's bad. If I could have picked where I bought my land, I definitely wouldn't have picked having uh, conventional farming on two sides of my farm because that is a pain in the tuchus to have to deal with the spraying and the runoff and all of the things that come with that type of farming um, surrounding me. So it was a blessing and somewhat of a curse because I can't sell it and, and move somewhere more um, hospitable. Yeah, um, or more organic. Or more, yeah, right, right. Uh -huh. So, but we make the most of what we have and we have lots of buffer zones and uh, places for critters and things like that, that uh, kind of help to shield us from that other part of the part of what's going on in our neighborhood. Um, so anyway, yeah, lucky enough to have family land. So when your mom dies, then does the land then come to you? It'll come to my sister and I. Mm -hmm. So then I will officially own land with my sister. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's a whole nother story. Yes. There's none of those questions are on here. No. <laughs> Which is good. <laughs> yes. So, so uh, how do you maintain a work and life balance? And maybe talk a little bit about this year of your life in particular, not so much about COVID, but you've had some real uh, eye-opening challenges. And yes, to talk a little bit about that. So I've always been kind of a, well, I mean, farming is a lifestyle. It's not, it's yeah. not just a job. It's mm -hmm. a lifestyle, yeah. you know, so you live at your job and, uh, when the wind is blowing, you're up all night because you're worried about a tree falling on the fence or 
you know, and the, your livestock getting out or the roof blowing off of the barn or any other thing that you can imagine uh, at three o'clock in the morning when the wind is howling, you think of all the bad things, the power's going to go off and I'm going to lose all my meat. And yeah, well, how are you going to get the, the bison back in? Because you don't go here, kitty, kitty. And they come <laughs> right, out. right. So, um, yeah. Uh, so the work-life balance, uh, I'm a workaholic. I'll admit that. And uh, I kind of just take stress on and pile it on. And so that kind of bit me in the butt last year because um, all of that sort of uh, piled up on me and I ended up with breast cancer. And so I had to become more intentional about what I'm doing. I have to take time for self-care, which has never been my forte. So now I'm, uh, you know, every morning I take supplements that help me. I am working on stress reduction. Um, I have this mat, it's called a spook mat, and it's got all these little fingers on it. It's like an acupressure mat. And you look at it and you think it's some sort of a torture device because uh, you're supposed to lay on it to, basically with no shirt on. And so, but that is super, uh, super relaxing. You wouldn't think it would be. And it usually puts me to sleep by the end of the day or by the end of the time that I'm laying on the mat. And so I usually do that at the end of the day. And then I have some breathing exercises that I do. And I uh, have reduced stress as far as, um, I just made up my mind I was gonna be less stressed out about certain things. And so I have just, sort of blocked that out and not blocked it out but just decided I'm not going to be involved in that and uh that's worked out pretty well how how did you figure out how to be intentional in this in this approach to trying to find health for yourself after cancer well I've read like I don't know how many books on breast cancer um and, it, and they all talked about the same things, like seven things in your life, you know, about having balance and about stress and uh, taking care of yourself and eating the right foods. And, um, but yeah, dealing with your crap, you know? So I figured if multiple people were saying it, it must, there must be something about it. Um, so cancer can't live in a healthy body. And so what do I need to do to make my body healthy to where cancer doesn't want to set up camp anymore? So that's, that's pretty much what uh, that. And then I had a really great friend network who uh, helped me uh, <laughs> send me words of affirmation. Uh, you sent me a box with uh, the word of the day in it. And so every day I would pick out a, a powerful word from that box and I would uh, think about it and think about how that would apply to my day and go from there. But lots of women reached out to me and uh, sent me encouraging words or poems mm -hmm. or just touched base with me. We set up a me. network of yeah, women and that, that committed was, to the day each day to yeah, get in touch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was during my recovery. And then, of course, you've kept up and had a couple other friends that uh, committed to still reaching out to me um, that their day of the week. And I honestly feel like that helped a lot because it was like I took the power from that into mm -hmm. me and it really helped my healing process. So, yeah. Yeah, I think, too, I remember, you know, when I was making the cards, I called them Buffalo Gal cards. And, um, and I just kept trying to think about if I was trying to heal myself, how would this word, you know, work with that? And I know uh, it was interesting because I felt like I was a little girl and I was putting my heart out in that box. And I know I drove you crazy. I called every day and said, what's the word of the day? Or well, you text didn't you. Drive me crazy. I know, but I worried I was driving you crazy. <laughs> no. But I just thought, you know, we're on a roll here and it's all going well. And if I just ask, how are you taking care of yourself? And mm -hmm. but I think it's the power of, you know, close relationships with people because I remember calling you and saying, let me take care of you. Yes. And I was afraid you'd say no or just not call back. <laughs> whatever <laughs> so so what's your go-to for self-care I mean the really important things you you had a list but 
Yeah. You're having um, a bad day or you're having, you haven't had enough sleep or you're mad at Jerry. Oh, I never get mad at Jerry. Okay. Well, you never, <laughs> on the days you never get mad at Jerry. <laughs> so like, I, lo- I love music. So we always have music going on. I subscribe to uh, Sirius XM and um, Amazon and so there's just a myriad of music that I can listen to. And so I choose the mood of the day with the station that I pick, you know, and it's mm-hmm. whether it's um, country music or uh, island vibe music or something like that. Oh, and on vibe. Sunday, yeah. Sunday is, we call it church, but um, every Sunday we drink Hawaiian coffee and we listen to Hawaiian music and we have one certain song that we listen to. Uh, every weekend and so that kind of like sets off the the morning once the coffee is ready we we listen to that song and drink the coffee and maybe look at some pictures from all of our trips to Hawaii and just kind of go there in our minds a little bit so that's really good but um yeah every day I'm listening to music and I listen to podcasts that I like um, that kind of helps reduce stress. It helps me learn some stuff. Um, of course, there's still lots of stressful things in the day, but uh, I try to reduce how that stress impacts me. Right. What you, you know, tell you, yourself right, about it. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, you're never going to have a stress free, stress free life, but how I handle that stress and how I react to that stress has changed. Mm-hmm. So. And, you know, doing the things, the, the breathing exercises and taking the supplements and eating, like I've changed my diet as well. So, you know, even though I might want to eat a sugar cookie because I love sugar cookies or I might want to eat peeps or something like that. Peeps. Whoa. <laughs> because I, love I can't even imagine. Peeps. Oh my gosh. I'm a, I was a peep addict, but I'm reformed now. Good to know. I was worrying. <laughs> yeah. So peeps. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, 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 the little bunnies. I love to eat the, the ears off a little bit. Oh, I can't even imagine <laughs> but, it. So I've, I've cut that stuff out of my diet and hopefully that will make me healthier. Yeah, well, I feel like it has. White sugar is really irritating to the entire system. It's like alcohol, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. So, so are there any helpful tools that you've used to get started or make a living? I would say my number one tool is networking. Um, when we first started with the bison, like YouTube wasn't a thing, you know, 13 years ago, believe it or not, there wasn't a bazillion videos that you could watch about building a fence or um, raising bison on YouTube. So uh, I had to reach out to other people who were doing it and kind of get a feel for what they were doing, read good old fashioned books uh, Mm -hmm. about bison. Um, And 13 years ago, there wasn't nearly as much information out there as there is now. Um, So that's the reason that you bought the herd and you didn't have any fence because there was no YouTube. (laughs) No, I just did that because I was impulsive. But um, well, just tell that story. It's such a good one. I um, love that story. That's the first story you ever told me. And I just thought, oh man, that is a woman after my own heart, even though I would not do that. I would have been a nervous wreck. um, So uh, there's nothing easy about bison. Uh, So (laughs) <laughs> I didn't know that at the time, really. Thank goodness. But right now, yeah, I might not it. have done it. So anyway, yeah, we um, we had planned to start small and just get a few calves. And then one Sunday uh, in February of 2008, Jared was perusing the Columbus Dispatch because people still read the newspaper back then and people still put in classified ads and things like that. So uh, Jared found an ad for a herd of bison for sale uh, in Mount Vernon, which is just an hour north of us. So we thought, well, we should go and talk to him. We should go pick his brain. And I had never even met a bison. And here I was fantasizing about (laughs) raising bison. bison. Yeah. So (laughs) we went to just look at the herd of bison and uh, we got up there and he had the most gorgeous bull. He looked like the bowl the buffalo bowl on the back of the nickel like just picture perfect had a nice hump yeah a nice tiny had a beautiful mane and yeah oh my gosh he's just gorgeous and so we we asked questions you know the kind of questions that greenhorns ask and <laughs> uh 
so he he told us all about it and then he said uh yeah well if no one buys them they're all going to go to the processor and so it was like oh no they can't not charlie charlie can't go to the processor so um on the way home we we knew what we had to do we knew we had to buy those bison and so we uh went back up the next day and agreed to buy the herd of bison which wouldn't have been a problem except we had no truck we had no barn we had no <laughs> fence. fence um so yeah that was uh that was a great way to get started uh, luckily the guy agreed to keep them uh, at his place so we didn't have to tie the concrete blocks in the backyard and hope they stayed or anything um but that started a uh chain reaction of things so we went and bought a truck the next week since uh we were gonna have to haul things for these bison hay and feed and whatnot so and then we went and talked to a fence uh dealer and he kind of gave us all the pointers on what we needed to know about building a fence to hold in these massive beasts so um he he gave us kind of the scoop on how to build this fence because I had never built fence before in my life and why I thought that it was a good idea to you know just buy a herd of bison and build the fence uh I don't know but uh naivete as they say yeah and that was probably a good thing because it was a big well, yeah, undertake if, if you'd you know, known what was involved you might not have ever done right it. right and so we went and we bought all these materials and we brought them back to the house and we rented a pounder so that we could drive these posts in because that's what uh yeah no kidding they told us was that having um the posts driven in rather than digging the post right, holes and filling them be in. softer otherwise Right, and you know, trying to hold in bison, and we wanted it to be as strong as possible. So we had all these parts and we're like trying to figure it, you know, putting together a jigsaw puzzle, really, how are we gonna put all these parts together? So since there was no YouTube, we would jump in the car or the truck and drive down the road and look at the neighbor's fence and be like, well, how in the heck did they do that? And so we got it figured out and it's not too bad because here we are 13 years later and that fence is still, still holding up, so. Uh, we've done nothing but build fence and, and things since then. But uh, yeah, so networking was a good tool to have then and field trips and uh, just a good old brain between the ears was a good uh, logic tool, logic, intelligence. So, so then here's the end of the story that I love. And that is, you know, they're coming, the bison are coming on the trailer, somebody's hauling them. And you're not really ready. Yes. And you can hear the trailer. Yes. The so, truck coming up the road. Uh huh. And yeah. So we live in um, on a dirt road. Well, I mean, it's paved, but it's got a lot of gravel on it. So, and it's it's kind of potholy in places. And so we're scurrying about, knowing that the bison are coming because we didn't have a truck in, or well, we had a truck, but we didn't have a, a livestock trailer. So we were paying someone to haul these bison from Mount Vernon down to our farm. And we're scurrying around and we're like, oh my gosh, the fence isn't working right. Or do we have electricity like right electric, on the fence? Is, yeah. it gonna, is it gonna hold? And then uh -huh. I hear this chain, chain, chain uh -huh. of the trailer coming across the top of the hill because we live down a valley, Cherokee Valley. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, we saw it coming across the hill and it just like all this adrenaline rush, like, oh yeah. my gosh, our dream is coming true. And so six weeks after we had um, bought a herd of bison, uh, they were there at our farm, not a whole herd, but a couple at a time. And there was just nothing like seeing those bison run through the pasture for the first time, like, wow. And uh, yeah, within six weeks, they were all at our farm one trailer load at a time but uh boy that first trailer load was just amazing yeah so so the other question has to do with making a living so then i know you did other things like have pigs you know i know you enjoyed having goats and how you got to chase them every day because yes, bison was so fencing enjoyable. is not goat fencing <laughs> right, and things right. like that <laughs> but so how did you end up figuring out or how have you made a living well, we um, we kind of bought a ready-made business, essentially. Um, we bought cat, uh, cows that were getting ready to have babies, and we bought animals that were ready to go to the harvest. And so we kind of jumped in with both feet and learned how to do marketing. Um, both of us still had a full-time job at the time. So 
I was, um, we had these snack sticks and uh, I would go to work and I would like give those out to people. <laughs> Just I like, like in school with I the bubble was, gum. Exactly. I was like a drug dealer though. It was like, here you go. You can try it. The first hit's free, you know? <laughs> I can just see you saying that. <laughs> well, you know, I probably did. because. <laughs> oh, yeah. So anyway. Only one hit for you. That's right. So I would give those away. And then of course people then started buying it. And then we started going to farmer's markets after that. And uh, we really got a good, like a client list built up. And then just a couple of years into raising bison, we decided we would build a store store at our farm. It was it's like a shed with freezers in it, and, but it keeps people from coming in my house and it's a, a yeah, good place to transact business. Yes. Um, Cause yeah, busy doing everything else. Cleaning the house is definitely not top of my priority list. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was how I got started marketing the bison. And then um kind of figured it out from there that was before Facebook or any of that stuff and we've just we've done basically what it took because we started out with kind of a small herd um, and so to keep on making money uh, like you said you have to have many baskets so yeah we just found ways to fill baskets and um, <laughs> one time I, this is a funny story because we were going to have this really great um, farm agritourism Kind of thing but this was we've always been ahead of our time so we were going to have um an on-farm like we were going to do a straw bale maze and a corn box and uh a petting zoo and a pony to ride and all of this kind of stuff and we built a gate across the front of our barnyard and so that way we could hold back the crowds that were going to show up <laughs> <laughs> for this great venture and so um Kevin Costner was wrong. If you build it, they will not necessarily come. No, you have because, to build the right thing for yeah. be a movie. Yeah. So <laughs> we built it and they did not come. And so that idea quickly, the corn molded in the box and the hay and the straw got all rained on and it just, it was a flop. So, but you have to be adventurous and try new things, right? Mm -hmm. Just keep throwing ideas at the wall until something sticks. And so, um, one year I did, a, I called it the harvest day and it was in the, in the autumn and we had been, we had raised a bunch of food in our garden just for ourselves and my sister and her husband helped. And so we had flowers and we made different kinds of jams and jellies. And uh, it was amazing how many people came out for that. And we didn't charge anything for it. It was just come out and enjoy the day. And uh, my cousin Charlene did face painting and things like that. Um, and we just had the, like different information stations around the farm where people could go and look and learn about pigs and turkeys and chickens. And we had rabbits and we had a pony and we had goats and all that kind of stuff. So it was, it was really engaging for the kids. Um, kids are never very impressed by bison. <laughs> they're um, too big and they're well, too Well, they don't get what they are. They don't yeah. get their significance. You know, they're yeah. like, yeah, it's a big brown cow, big, big deal, you know, whereas adults are usually more intrigued by the bison so anyway that I sold an entire bison in that one day just people coming out to the farm I gave out samples of uh, different the different meats that we were raising and so yeah just you know always always looking for the next creative idea to get people out there and yeah not being afraid to try things that's a that's a good tool. yeah well it's good to have options isn't it yeah so where do you want to be in five years with your work and your personal life? Well, um, I don't necessarily have a five-year plan, but I do have goals that I want to accomplish. So I would like to have 50 bison uh, within the next five years. I'll, I would like to um, share our farm through events and through um, some on-farm camping um through some agritourism uh you know we were starting to do that stuff last year and then i had the cancer and the covid the two c's kind of wrecked yeah. 2020 and so um i haven't really figured out what uh, this year's going to look like as far as that those goals go but um and then uh, i would like to do more educational things and that's in the works with what you and I are doing this year. Um, I would like to teach more 
um, bison workshops. Um, like how to raise bison? Yeah, so there's so many different ways to raise bison and kind of everybody has to figure out what works for them. But a lot of times when people are getting into bison ranching, they don't know what they don't know. Yeah. So uh, I call it my bison primer. So it tells people, you know, here's things to consider before you start buying bison, you know, make sure you have a way if you before you bring one bison onto your farm, make sure you have a way to get that bison off of your farm eventually, because they're big, expensive, hairy beasts. And uh, you're not going to be very happy when you figure out, oh my gosh, I have no way to get this bison to a processor or to sell to somebody or anything like that. So those are the kind of things that I try to hammer home to people that are wanting to get into bison. And I do a lot of that now. Like people call me and ask me questions about bison. And so I would like to have a, a set schedule where I'm doing regular workshops at the farm or even virtually. Um, or a list of frequently asked questions. True. <laughs> that, that's a good idea, really. Yeah, on your website. Uh huh. Yeah. And so, and then I want to keep working with you. That's one of my goals is to, to keep working with you for the next five years, at least. Probably after longer. that, I might be too old to work with mm -hmm. me. But you might be tiring me, but then. Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm sure not. And we've been we've been working together a long time, what six or seven years, yeah, I think. Yeah, a while. Yeah. So it's just we have a lot of fun together, and we're we're smart together. We make yeah. each other smarter. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. So what about your personal life? Um, I still want to be healthy. Um. And I uh, want to be able to have time to, you know, I'd like to have some of the major projects wrapped up so that I'm not working every minute of every day and every weekend and um, planning our summers based on what projects we're working on. Um, you know, there's always going to be maintenance, but I'd like to be done with the farm projects, the major farm projects in the next five years. Like so, the infrastructure to have it in right, place. Right, mm -hmm. like, you know. I mean, there's always something, obviously, and I always hatch up a new idea every year, it seems like. So, um, but I hope to have more time to, to do just fun things. What kind of fun thing? Well, I take that, I have this cute little uh, convertible car. Yeah. And so <laughs> we usually end up working all summer. And so there's no time to enjoy rides uh, on the weekends in that fun little car. And so I want to have time to go for rides in the car at the very least and travel. I love to travel. And so there's a lot of places I want to see. Um, Hawaii again, for sure. I mean, I've only been there four times. So yeah. only four times <laughs> and uh, Costa Rica and some other places. So I want to, I want to be able to do that. So what challenges have you faced in your particular part of the agriculture industry and, and how did you deal with those or overcome those challenges? So I think if you look in the dictionary under challenge, there's a picture of bison. So <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing that's not challenging about bison. Um, bison are very hands off. So uh, when we are getting one into like trying to do something with one of them, we have to um, think like a bison and uh, they say you can get a buffalo to do anything it wants to so make we have it their to, idea we have to figure out how to make it want to do what we want it to do um, also aren't they pretty stressed out when they're like forced into tight quarters and things so bison have a really strong herd instinct they want to be together and when you get one bison separated from the herd it is in a panic mode it is no longer thinking about food or anything like yeah, that. It's afraid. Right. So um, we do very low stress handling. So um, we have a corral uh, where everyone goes to drink. Like we have the water there and we have the minerals there. So they're used to coming up into the corral. So it's not stressful for them when they're in there. And so on the day that we're going to do something with them, whether we're going to run them through our squeeze chute or we're going to um, load one into the trailer. We use a treat called chaffe and it's like oh, yeah. buffalo crack. So we crinkle the bag. <laughs> I 
And, and if they're in our farthest away pasture, they'll come running for that buffalo crack. So we get them all up into the pasture and close the gates and then, or into that corral and close the gates and then start working, you know, whether, whether we're gonna work them all, we'll get them up in, in groups because they're happier together. Mm -hmm. Or if we're gonna load one, then we start letting out the ones that we don't want until we get the one we do want in there. But we don't go in with the bison. We don't go into yeah. pasture with them because <laughs> yeah. when they're stressed out, they can jump six foot from a standstill. If they can get their head over it, they can jump it. So our corrals are, or our handling system area is like seven foot tall plus in areas um, because they can climb and then if they get their feet up, then they kind of can jump. Pull themselves and, up. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and when they get stressed out, they do crazy stuff. Like they start jumping over gates yes, and they could die too. Right. Ruminants are really crazy. Right. You know, like capture myopathy is a thing for bison because they're still kind of wild. And so everything that we do, we keep that in mind. So um, a stressed out bison can do a lot of damage to equipment. It can do damage to people, um, can tear through your fence. Um, they can jump over a center gate in a trailer and hang themselves, um, all kinds of crazy things. So or injure themselves to the point where you can't help them. They could bleed to death or whatever. Right, right. So we're very intentional about being low stress. And, you know, it, it works out for the most part. I mean, there are animals who teach us things uh, yeah. that we need to, to change or to uh, tweak a little bit. And so... Um, so yeah. they're good at showing you that they are very they're very good teachers yes i i know this from working with a variety <laughs> of animals but i i don't like to work with animals like i i didn't really like working with llamas yeah um because they they really they're very intelligent which i like that about ghosts they're intelligent but mm -hmm. they aren't very domesticated so you call their name and they're like you know go to hell yeah Whereas goats answer you, well, my goats answer because they know I want them to come. They might be like, when I'm ready, right? but I right. did hear you and mm -hmm. I will show up because you are important to me. Yeah. So I, it would be hard to work with bison under those circumstances. Yeah. I mean, they don't come to their name, but I do know how to speak their language. It's mm -hmm. the, the crinkle of the bag. Or yeah. if I want them to go to the next pasture, I jingle the chain and that gets their attention. And I go, woo. And yeah. I call them and that gets their attention. And so then they figure out that it's time to go to a new pasture and they love that. So yeah. everyone, that's what everyone thinks. How do you get them to go to the next pasture? And it's like, oh, that's the easiest part of the job because they want to. They're very yeah. nosy and very curious and they like to yeah. roam. I would say make it their idea. Yep. So what assistance do you, oh, wait, I'm on the wrong question. What challenges uh, have, you paid, have you faced in your particular part of the industry? We just talked about that one. I, I know, but I mean, in the industry itself, not not just as being the bison farmer rancher, but in the bigger picture of, you know, is this is this a world for women? Is this a an industry that embraces, you know, your style of management? That that's um, the kind of thing. I'm definitely the weirdo in our. Um, there's a lot of people that are doing the grass fed, but. Um, so you're weird because you're doing grass fed? Well, yeah, because there's a lot of people that do bison and, and feed lot them or uh -huh. they do feed grain. And um, our customers want um, grass fed. That's who we, that's my customer is somebody who um, wants to buy um, a high quality, uh, good fats, meat product. So a healthy protein and bison fit that. Uh, description when they're grass fed they have lots of good omega-3s and that kind of thing um there's no other challenges being a woman is a good it's a good type of farming to do well i uh i suppose it could be a little bit intimidating for women to get into um there's more and more women getting into the bison industry. Um, I have never uh, let that stop me. Uh, I, I see that. I haven't asked for permission. So, okay. Uh, 
That's just apologized. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You know, I'm lucky because my grandmother was a badass woman and she did whatever the hell she wanted to do. She didn't wait for anyone to give her permission. And so I sort of came up with that, you know, or have that attitude myself. You know, I've, I've worked in very non-traditional women's jobs my whole life. And so uh, I guess me personally, it hasn't impacted as much. You know, I get comments from, from men, you know, can I back your trailer up for you? Or can I operate that ratchet strap for you? Um, honey. Honey, yeah, <laughs> uh, that kind of thing. But I just, I just roll with it, you know? I don't let them get to me, so uh, yeah. All right, so what assistance do you know for, uh, that's out there for women that are in agriculture? Well, there really isn't a lot specifically for women. Um, WFAN uh, seems to be a great national uh, thing for women. And, you know, there's groups that uh, sort of cater to your big farming women, like uh, your uh, crop farmers. Um, but for small scale, sustainable farming women, there isn't a lot out there. Um, I've had to find groups on Facebook to be a part of, like for specifically for women. Um, there's one called Women in Sustainable Agriculture on Facebook. Um, and it's a good place to go to commiserate and uh, bounce ideas off other women. Um, there's one called Amazons of Agriculture that- uh, Oh, that's a good Amazons <laughs> <know>. for <laughs> Wow. So, you know, there's a few groups like that where you can go and kind of chit chat. And you and I are working to build uh, a group for women farmers, um, Buffalo Gals Voices, and we're teaching women how to grab life from, by the horns so they yeah. can be badass women farmers as well. And be able to just let it slide off their shoulders when someone says something to them instead of, you know, letting it impact their day. Yeah. Or wear a button. I'm the farmer. That's right. I'm the <laughs> farmer. Um, yeah. And uh, what was the rest of the question? I think I think you got yeah, it. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. So That's what cool. role what role do you see women playing in agriculture now and then in the future? I think that there are way more women farmers than women farmers think there are. Yeah, or men think there are. Or men think there are. Mm -hmm. um, women are doing a lot of times smaller farms um, because we are more in touch with the earth and we want to do things the right way. We want to um, heal the earth and we want to nurture the earth and we want to nurture these animals. Um, and, and vegetables and, and things like that and our families. And we're thinking um, about that end in, in user when we're growing things. Like I'm growing food that's fit to eat for my family. I'm not gonna grow anything else and I'm not gonna um, let my standards slide uh, on that. So <clears throat> I think that there's a lot of women out there who are farming. And I know lots and lots of women farmers. And so we just aren't getting the recognition. Um, but I think that women farmers are going to uh, just keep, the, the number of women farmers is gonna keep growing because it's a career that's very good for us. It's very suited to being a woman. And really it's an indigenous um, trade, if you will. Um, I'm Native American and the women were the farmers in the Native American mm -hmm. community. You know, they were the ones planting the gardens and uh, growing the food and things like that. Whereas the men were out, you know, fighting or gallivanting, gallivanting <laughs> or hunting <laughs> and things like that. But the women were the ones nurturing the earth and growing the food and things like that. And so, uh, and I, I think so many people are farmers that don't realize they're farmers, you know, whether you're growing a a big garden in your backyard to feed your family. I mean, that's farming. Um, my grandma always made farming sound like a dirty word because uh, as I mentioned, we're surrounded by uh, conventional farming on two sides. And uh, my grandma used to curse farmers. And I well, she was a horse breeder. So right, so she wasn't really she a was farmer. A little she, above that. <laughs> right, so she, you know, she grew hay and 
uh, tended to hay and that kind of stuff. And we always had some kind of critter or another on grandma's farm. There was goats and chickens and peacocks and horses and cows and, you know, everything you could think of. Grandpa was a wheeler dealer. And so he'd go to the auction and he'd always come home with something crazy for us kids to play with. And But uh, grandma cursed farmers. And so it was like, ooh, farmer's a dirty word. But she was more meaning the big crop farmers. But um, I don't think we'll see a lot of women in that industry, but I think that we'll see women in the small scale sustainable agriculture uh, end of things. So how do you think women are going to influence agriculture in the future? I think that women are going to hopefully change the way it's done, you know. Mm. That would be a lot of our hopes, wouldn't it? It would be. So you think that women learn from hearing other women's stories? I, I think do. that's valuable. It's like in our sort of our DNA almost of how we've learned in the past. Right. Yeah. And I think it definitely tweaks something in our genes to, to hear those stories oh, from yeah. other women, you know? And well, and it's encouraging too to be like, well, shit, if she can do it, I can do it. Yeah, you know, that's or, right. you know, wow, look at that woman doing that crazy amazing thing I can do it. it it gives you hope I think when you see other women doing it and um I just got done reading a book called the confidence code and it talked about how women were so much more comfortable in groups of other women you know there was so much more interaction and so many more ideas shared than if there were men in the room and so I think that that's a powerful uh, thing for women to to come together and share their stories and share their how to's and um, the secret code. The secret code. Not That's right. Language. The hacks. So, so even though we have computers, we still need to hear women's stories. Mm -hmm. All right. So, what can the government and industry and academic institutions do to inspire the next generation of farm women? Well, I think that the government needs to start incentivizing, incentivizing that's easy for me to say, um, <laughs> doing the right thing. And by the right thing, I mean um, not tilling. I think that they should offer incentives to people to uh, have more trees, um, to do soil pasture, um, to have uh, buffer zones and areas for wildlife instead of uh, all these subsidies to, that go to crop farmers, you know, that incentivize them to cut down all of the, the, the tree lines and so that they have room to get a bigger bean head turned around or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, to destroy things that are um, creating oxygen and sequestering carbon. I mean, that's essentially what the government is paying for right now <clears throat> is to destroy the planet. So I think that we need to have a, a turn to where they quit incentivizing that kind of farming and start incentivizing my kind of farming. Um, and I think that schools um, should quit teaching. You know, every year the uh, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492 or whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, start teaching. You know, here's a packet of seeds and here's how you put it in the ground and here's how you grow food for yourself so that you're not at the mercy. Um, like when we have an event like last year uh, of COVID uh, where people are scrambling because there's food shortages because it can't be shipped to them or uh, somebody's buying it all and hoarding it. So um, I think that that will teach a little bit of resil resiliency to these kids, you know. I was lucky. I didn't think I was lucky when I was a kid that my mom was making me work in the garden. Um, but now I see that I was lucky to have, have that influence, you know, to know how to grow food for myself. And I can be uh, self-reliant. Um, so I think that that's what schools should be doing is uh, instilling a love for growing food in children. You know, we all have this in our DNA, you know, we all come from some kind of farmers and some kind of keepers of the land. And mm -hmm. it's a shame that we don't honor that more. Um, so what's your favorite frugal marketing tip? Well, I am cheap, cheap, cheap. So, <laughs> <laughs> and you're not a chick. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Although I do like to hang out with little chicks, but um, no. So, uh, my favorite frugal marketing is, uh, you know, there, there's multiple 
ways to reach out to potential customers. And so uh, things I've done, uh, I spoke at a rotary meeting one time. I went in and I, I thought it was a flop because I had forgot to convert my file from a, a, a Mac file to a Windows file. And so I wasn't able to use my PowerPoint, which was sort of my crutch. But uh, somehow I winged it and uh, talked to this room full of people about our farm and our bison because you know they have a meeting every month and they get tired of hearing the same old thing over and over again so reaching out to different clubs and organizations is free to you and then it gets uh, attention for your business yeah um, local local people yeah so what's your most effective social media tip well i like to use humor um <laughs> So puns. you like humor puns, puns um, <laughs> and sometimes I'm a little bit naughty. Um, oh no, you know, you're kidding. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> you know, uh, our website for a long time was wild, woolly and horny. Uh, yes. The first time com. I heard that, I was like, whoa. Yeah. But you know, bison are, have horns. Yes, and they so do. But I didn't make woolly. that connection. And, right. I but, just thought you were really being ornery. <laughs> well, I was, but uh, <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> and it's true. They're wild, woolly, and horny. And sometimes they're hornier than others. That's right. Uh, you know, come July or August, they're really horny. But um, anyway, so that gets people to laugh. Um, but anyway, uh, so I used to sell Thanksgiving turkeys. And so for the month before Thanksgiving, I would start sharing like a turkey joke or a turkey cartoon mm -hmm. or something like that every day. And um, so Facebook works really good on engagement. So I would ask, what's your favorite recipe or that kind of thing? What's your go-to Thanksgiving dinner uh, item that you can't live without? And just every, every post, try to get engagement on it um, and, and humor. And then, of course, people love to see pictures of babies. So baby bison always get me a lot of likes and views and engagements. And they love to see pictures of my bull tearing up hay bales. So I will put hay out and then I will wait for the moment that the bull is running around the pasture and uh, pushing the hay bale around the pasture. And that always gets me tons of likes. and and follows and that kind of thing so so just capturing the moment right so what do you think success looks like i think um having enough is what success looks like having enough money to pay my bills having enough time to enjoy my life you know uh to take care of what i need to take care of but also to travel and that kind of thing um having uh, being healthy enough to be able to do my work every day. Um, you know, there was a time last summer when I was pretty much sitting on my hands and I couldn't do anything. And boy, that was horrible. I hate that feeling. Um, I think uh, having enough knowledge to be able to take care of my animals and them not, you know, to die out in the pasture because I don't know anything. So um, having enough animals to meet the needs of my customers, just having enough. I don't, I'm not greedy. I don't want too much, but enough is good for me. I feel like that's a successful thing. So what's the best advice that you ever received? Man, I've gotten a lot of advice over the years, but my grandma always said the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And so I try to remember that. And, uh, when I'm needing oil, I try to remember to squeak and uh, get the attention that I need. Because, you know, people don't necessarily know you need something unless you're letting them know. So be a squeaky wheel. That's true. Yeah. So anything else you wanted to share or that we didn't cover? I don't think so. No? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Well, so that, that's the, as they say, the end of our service. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.